you have any yeah. any Chiefs gear that you like to wear, you know? Uh, I have an Andy Reid shirt okay. that I like to wear. And but I do have, you have to wear it for, oh, for each game? You know, no, not really. Uh, I kind of started off the season that way, but they didn't do very good, so okay. I stopped doing that. <laughs> Welcome to TBC Extra, a weekly podcast of our Sunday sermon and a little extra. I am Teresa Jenkins, the communications director here at Topeka Bible Church. And I'm Jason Brent, the children's pastor at Topeka Bible Church. And we're glad you're here. And now for a little extra. Welcome everyone to TBC Extra. And we're joined today by a very special guest, Jeremiah Devine. Hey, everyone. Hey, Jeremiah. How you doing? Good. How are you, Jason? I'm doing pretty good. Good. Glad to be here. Yeah. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Teresa had other uh, engagements, and so she couldn't be here. But uh, the sermon on Sunday mostly rested on the idea of karma. Yes. But Connor did mention something during the sermon that I think probably pricked a lot of people's ears, and probably because you know the Chiefs were playing on on that day, yeah, on big Sunday, game, coming up. big game, yep. and everything, and so people were decked out in their Chiefs. <laughs> in fact, one of my vo- volunteers in Sunday school actually said to me, "Jason, where's your Chiefs stuff?" And I, I don't know. I, maybe this week I'll wear some, something. Something. Yeah, do you be, have any yeah. any Chiefs gear that you like to wear? You know, uh, I have an Andy Reid shirt. Okay. That I like to wear, and but I do have, you have to wear it for oh, for each game? You know, no, not really. Uh, I kind of started off the season that way, but they didn't do very good, so okay. I stopped doing that. <laughs> yeah, but so yeah, I have a snow hat that uh, I bought at my very first Chiefs game, yeah, and I love to wear it even if I'm just home. You know, I'm right, right. Don't have a reason to wear it, even if you're than, not cold. Right. This, yeah. The Chiefs are playing, so I've got my hat on, and it's kind of oh, fun. We it's pass the one it around you wear when they're playing. And yeah. You pass it around. Yeah, we pass it around like so. Pierce wore it for the last game that we watched together on TV, and right. just kind of fun. Yeah, and he kind of tied that into the superstition part uh, yeah. of everything, which is kind of interesting to think about. Uh, I think partially we do that in good fun, but some people really do have like super, like start really believing a little probably a little too deeply into yeah like that. They, they think you know i've got to drink uh two bottles of water before the game starts and then one at halftime and wow like there's a certain yeah. regimen that you have to do to you know get the result to be exactly what you're hoping yeah. for yeah but regardless it was a really fun game it and was they, and they won so that was really fun yeah and you uh i thought that you weren't going to be able to watch the game because yeah. you were up in kansas city yeah we went to winter jam uh, which is a Christian concert festival at yeah. T-Mobile in Kansas City. And so I went with my sister, and she was able to actually get the game on. She has Paramount Plus, you know, <laughs> on her phone. And so she was worshiping, of course, and engaging in the in the concert, but also checking in, you know, every 10 <laughs> minutes on the game and the score and everything. It was kind of fun because a new song, one of the Christian bands, okay, was yeah. performing. And uh, this was near the end, and I think Travis Kelsey just made a touchdown. Uh-huh. We could hear this uproar from a crowd of probably what sounded like 200 maybe 300 people up on a main concourse at t-mobile center and uh it was just kind of separated from the main arena by a black uh curtain yeah yeah so you could hear this uproar of people you was know it, and were they watching like, like was there a tv in there or something yeah, they, oh, yeah. so on the main concourse at t-mobile they have some areas that are sort of set up like a restaurant or yeah a, yeah or a bar and grill yes kind of thing and they have five tvs or so in each area <laughs> they had the game on during the concert so people were moseying out there and so some people were watching the game while the concert was going and then after the game went back to the concert definitely you could sit out there i sat out there for you know 30 minutes during uh one of the bands was really loud and so i went and sat out there (laughs) and i I could still hear easily the concert lecrae was performing yeah um but i watched the game during that and so but it was kind of funny because uh this the the main singer russ yeah he was talking um and just doing a little message of encouragement yeah. uh, as a part of the concert and you could hear the uproar of the crowd yeah. on, on that main concourse and he would stop and he'd say oh evidently the lord's you know really blessing the chiefs tonight <laughs> and, and uh he he kind of poked a little bit at that yeah. but he said uh, one of the things that i appreciated is just how he was able to kind of bring it back yeah and sure. just say you know that is really fun and that that's super exciting and you know that uh, it's it's fun to see your team succeed and sure. and everything, but uh, you guys really 
you know, made a great choice to come and to worship and to be in this place because um, while that's fun, this this has an eternal impact. Yeah. Yeah. What a great piece of encouragement he could give through that situation. Yeah. Yeah. And another piece of great encouragement is our sermon from this Sunday. Absolutely. So let's, uh, let's, let's take a look. Let's or check listen. it out. Yeah. Karma. some of you are very glad to be back here in the Mulvane Auditorium. I just want you, well, we miss our friends over in the cab. i just let you know the uh, Mulvane Cab Volleyball Tournament is coming up here pretty soon. <laughs> Hope you guys were able to square up your competition. We'll see who makes it out in the end. Um, and that's where we'll hold all these services. That's how we're going to decide it. No. So last week we started a, a new series called Enchanted and and also, I would say, so Jason gave a great message about how we need to trust in God and, and how uh, there's that ladder of trust, right? That we need to place the Lord at the very top of that ladder, and sometimes other things find their way up there. And Jason also made it one for one in his use of props in sermons, where I, I think I counted up, I'm at like 2% of the time I use props. So this is other thing that I'm, I'm going to try and work on, see if I can bring some more ladders on stage. <laughs> So this idea of enchanted, though, is the one that um, there are spiritual practices that have sort of made their way into our faith in God, um, our relationship with God, and that some of these things, they don't always, um, they're not always clear and present to us, um, but in fact, they sometimes weasel their way in. They take up sort of residence in the back parts of our heart. They're a little secretive. And so, of course, we might not say, as Jason said last week, that we don't trust in God or that um, he is not the, high, the one deserving of the highest place, but through our actions, does he always sort of reign there at the top? Well, this morning we're looking at a different kind of thing, and I want to talk about karma, actually, and how it is that karma weasels its way into our faith as well. And in fact, even if we would say that we don't believe in karma as maybe the, the Hindus or the Buddhists might, um, still how it has sort of parts of it have been added on to what we believe about God. So just to be clear, when we talk about karma, there is the broad belief, okay, that uh, good things, sort of good input results in good output, and bad input results in bad output. So good things happen to good people, and bad things happen to bad people. And then there's, kind of beyond that, there is this specific um, when you go beyond using karma in a general sense and into actually what that belief entails, it also has to do with the re uh, resurrection, excuse me, not resurrection, that's our thing. Um, it has to do with reincarnation. So when you talk about reincarnation, it's this idea that um, your actions in this life and uh, are basically leading forward into a new life where you will be better off or worse off than you currently are now. And your current state has to do with how you were in the past. Okay. So probably many of us would say, well, I don't, I don't believe in that. But yet, are there elements of it that we hold on to? Because there are, there are certain things that we love to see in this world where we might not use the word karma, but we'd say they had it coming to them, right? So think about you're at like a pool party, right? About six months from now. And <laughs> you're at that pool party and somebody's standing near the edge of the pool, you know, just having a conversation. And then the prankster is, comes up and they want to shove them into the pool. But as they do, the person turns to the side and the prankster goes toppling over into the pool. And you watch that and you say, ah, <laughs> had it coming to them, right? They got what they deserved. That's what they were trying to do. Uh, think another, you're on the highway, right? Maybe it's late at night, you're driving, it's pretty quiet, and all of a sudden a car just zooms right past you. 
30 miles faster than you're going right now, just blazing speed. And it's probably 10 minutes later that you catch up to them because they're pulled over on the side of the road with a couple lights blinking behind them, right? You say, they had it coming to them. So there is this internal sense of justice that we have almost where we're like, we like the idea Right, that God, maybe in those situations we would not say, well, God turned this person aside at the pool party, but nevertheless that they got what was coming to them. That sense of internal justice that we have sometimes finds its way into inappropriate places. Inappropriate in the sense that we apply it too much. Uh, you can also take this into things like superstition, right? I don't know how many of you are going to be wearing your particular chief's gear this evening, but I've got to tell you, it will not make, okay, the Bills secondary any worse at defending our receivers as much as you might like it to, as much as I might like it to. So when we we talk about these things, we understand that there are areas of our life where we're pulled into uh, sometimes attaching meaning to things that have no basis in reality, yet allowing it to control our behavior, right? So funny enough, the first sort of quote this morning uh, comes from Keanu Reeves. The recognition of the law of cause and effect, also known as karma, is a fundamental key to understand how you've created your world with actions of your body, speech, and mind. When you truly understand karma, then you realize you are responsible for everything in your life. It is incredibly empowering to know that the future is in your hands. So he get, Neo gave this interview, or it's not even an interview, it's a, actually a, like a Buddhist um, training video series that he did back in the 90s and uh, where he talks about these things. So and he is right about one thing. He is right about one thing. That is cause and effect, okay? It is comforting to us because it makes sense. It makes some sense of the world that we live in, that there might be this sort of, sort of enclosed sphere where everything that is good receives good and everything that is bad receives bad. Um, it, it, it doesn't have any loopholes to it, right? There's no way that people should be able to weasel out of this. And it also helps us to make sense of terrible things that happen because depending on how far you walk down this, there's this concept that, ev and this is true within those who practice karma and believe in it wholeheartedly, is it really came about by saying um, to Buddha, like, how is it that there are poor in this world and the needy and those who struggle and those who are born in the lowest caste? Like, how can we make sense of that? Because obviously we look out into a world that is not as it should be. And Buddha said, well, clearly it is because of the life that they lived previously. And so I'm not saying that people who believe in this don't have compassion, but there is a complete understanding for how and why this world has so much brokenness because it is what somebody is getting what they deserved from their past. Their actions have come forward. And so it makes us feel better because we can avoid pain or struggle by trying harder to be better people. But on the flip side, this is true with success as well. Somebody looks at the success that they have in this life, and normally the way that we look at success is about wealth and power and prestige and fame and all of those kinds of trappings, right? But the idea of success um, is also one where it's self-fulfilling. They say, well, obviously I have been blessed in this way uh, because I have done good things, and so furthermore, then it creates this illusion that anybody can be successful, as the world would say. Anybody can have those kinds of things. They can make be the A-list movie star by simply walking up the steps of putting good energy or setting a vision into the world. So there are probably some of those things, depending on where you're at, that you say, well, I don't believe that. But we might believe part of it. And at first glance, this idea of something being in our, you know, our lives are in our control, that things work out on our timeline, um, that we can be rewarded for being good people. This is actually something that at first glance the Bible almost seems to support. Listen to Job's friend Eliphaz speak with him about why he is experiencing so much trouble. Eliphaz says, consider, Job, who has perished when he was innocent? 
Where have the honest been destroyed? In my experience, those who plow injustice and those who sow trouble reap the same. So Job, or Eliphaz is speaking to his friend Job, and he says, well, Job, if you had only been more righteous, this wouldn't have happened to you. It has a really simple explanation for why you are struggling so much. If you would just, in fact, uh, his friend Bildad later on, another one of Job's friends, sort of gives the same message in a different way. He says, if you would simply repent of your sin, Job, and you would turn away from your foolishness, the Lord would fix all of these things. But if you know the story of Job, you know that the reason that he's going through hardship, ironically, is because he is a righteous person. And so this idea of reaping what you sow is something that we use to explain what's going on in this world, but it's not always accurate in the sense that they're talking about it. We can't draw conclusions about righteousness from somebody's fortune or failures. We want to. We want to do it in our own lives because it's has rules that we can clearly understand, but that is not how God works. If he was, then he would be like a vending machine, right? We put in exactly the amount that we need to get what we want in return, but the Lord doesn't work that way. But it's not just Eliphaz who believed this, right? It is not just him and and those who are commenting on Job's life. In fact, this is something the disciples struggled with as well. Look at this from John chapter 9. As he was passing by, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You can imagine their bigger question there. Jesus, this man, obviously he is blind, we get that, but um, tell us what he had done wrong so that his hardship makes sense to us that the grief that he has experienced by being blind his whole life, that there's something that tells us that he had deserved it all along. Jesus replies to them. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Jesus answered, this came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. It was God's will for the man to be born blind, but not because of his sin or his parents' sin. In this case, in this particular one, it was so that Jesus could heal this man and then he would go and be called before the Pharisees for having a miracle clearly performed upon him and he would testify about Jesus, about who he was and what he was doing. And in fact, in a funny way, he would ask the Pharisees, do you want to be a disciple of Jesus too? Because he was now. This is where we get the phrase, I was blind but now I can see. So a second time they summoned the man who had been blind and told him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. They talk about him in a weird way, even though he's right in front of them. He answered, whether or not he's a sinner, now he's in third person, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I can see. But they say, you were born entirely in sin, they replied, and are you trying to teach us that the difficulties of this world are not a direct result of sin? Well, they threw him out. So the Pharisees recognized that the man's healing was miraculous, but they persist in this idea that it was his sin which brought about the affliction. Bad equals bad, right? Okay, so here's where now we kind of step into a bit of, um, let's just say, nuance, okay? When we compare karma to what the Bible has for us, there are some similarities and there are some differences. Because if we look at these two passages, okay, God didn't afflict Job because of his sin, and the man was not born blind because of his sin, we might walk back and say, okay, case closed, so this never happens, that the Lord does not visit justice upon somebody, um, retribution for their sin, we'd say, so that never happens, right? No, it, it does happen, and in fact, it does happen quite frequently in the Bible, that individuals families, sometimes nations, experience the judgment of God because of their sin. This, if you want your vocab word for that, it's called retribution theology, but we're only going to use that a couple more times, and then we're going to speak about it more generally. But there is this a truth, and so this is what I want to kind of, we need to split this hair well, which is that there are times in the Bible where judgment is visited upon people because of their sin. 
Two quick examples. One might be in the book of Numbers. You have Miriam. This is Moses' sister. She rebels against his leadership, and she's afflicted with a skin disease immediately. Moses recognizes that that punishment is from the Lord, and he prays that the Lord would remove it, and he does. Or you might go to the book of Acts, where you have the the very, very early church, and and everybody is coming together and sharing what they have to help the poor and the needy, and Ananias and Sapphira sell some land and lie about part of it. They keep some of the money for themselves. That wasn't bad, but the fact that they lied about it was, and God strikes both of them dead immediately. Peter speaks to them, and he says, there's this very... uh, what am I saying? Not cold line, but just like hardcore, where he says, the footsteps of those that just buried your spouse are now coming to collect your body. And then they fall down dead. And you're like, oh boy, that's a power, Peter. You can do that. But this is an example where it does seem to be that certain things happen, retribution for those who rebel against God. So what are the differences and how might we separate these things from each other? Three questions that we need to ask. Three questions that clearly separate the way God's justice works from the way this fake system of karma works. The first question, who is in control? When you look at the Buddhist teachings of karma, we are in control of our destiny. In fact, they will use the phrase that we make our heaven and we make our hell. This idea that every single one of our actions is going to be returned to us in the appropriate and proper way sets expectations that we can control our future. And furthermore, that the experience that we have right now, though we don't remember our past lives, um, that they, where we are at now, our station in life is due to what we have done in the past. And so everything is within our control. And we like this. We like being in control. And so this is part of the reason why karma as a system is captivating to us because we love the idea that by trying harder, we can always improve our situation. And it's true, there are certain times in life where, generally speaking, good input good equals, equals good output, right? You, you go to the gym, generally speaking, if you're consistent with the gym, you're going to get better at doing things in the gym, okay? If you eat healthy, your body is going to feel better because you are putting good things into it. So occasionally this system works in our life, but you and I both know, we understand, we have lived long enough to see that this world does not go according to the way that we would always want it to go. If it did, there would not be pain and suffering. There would not be pain and suffering in our life. So this idea of control is present here, but what the Bible says instead, is that God is always in control. Though we have the ability, insofar as the Holy Spirit is within us, to avoid sin, to flee from it, to walk away, the idea that by removing sin from our life, we can exempt ourselves from suffering is foolishness. If that was the case, there would be no such thing as a martyr. If that was the case, the disciples would not have been stoned, beheaded, crucified, run through with spikes for their faith in Jesus Christ. If that was actually the case, there would be no suffering for any of us here, for those of us who are truly righteous, right? (laughs) There would be no such thing as pain, but we know that there is, and some of you are going through it. God is always in control. It's a hard thing for us to accept at times because not only do we like being in control, but once more, we have to then transfer some of that control that we want to have over to the Lord. And we give it up to him, the one who created us, the one who puts breath in our lungs, the one who uh, gives us another day, the one who knows the end of our days and will eventually call us home, the one who says that it is foolishness to act like we can actually control sort of what happens three years from now, though we might plan with wisdom and all of these things. God is the one who is in control. And so we say, what is the difference between karma and God's justice in this way? We say, well, in the one, we are always in control. We are always the final authority in what happens. We are the final say in our future. And the other one says, God is always in control. It is God's up to him 
when things happen, when they are allowed to happen, sometimes when hardships are allowed to occur. Second question, at what time? When does it happen? Well, if you look at karma, you're in a feedback loop, okay? Everything you do has a response, and it is either going to happen in this life or in, your, in the next one that you have, right? You're going to come back, and you will be paid back for the work that you've done in this life. It's a system that, as you keep hearing me saying, on paper, it makes sense, right? We have this expectation to get back what we deserve, and within karma, we think that we deserve quite a lot. And so when it comes to the timing of things, we expect and have a reliable sort of notion of, hey, I helped this person across the street. I, I don't know, paid it forward at the Starbucks line. And so now in my next life, I'm going to have a lot more money. I'm going to have a lot more skill and talent. But God does not work on our timeline, right? Listen to the, what he says to Abraham. Uh, in Genesis 15, when telling Abraham about what was going to happen in the future. He says, But you will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age, Abraham. In the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. What God is saying there, he's speaking to Abraham, who's currently living in uh, what would later be the land of Israel. He's living in the promised land. And Abraham, who was called there and has been faithful, is going to die and go to his ancestors, but or, and go to his ancestors, but his offspring, those who would go forth from him, from Isaac and Jacob, uh, they eventually are going to uh, face slavery for 400 years in Egypt. And by the way, that's the shorthand of what he's referring to here. The fourth generation, we mean 400 years. And so 400 years later, they're going to come out of the land of Egypt and return to where Abraham is right now. And at that time... This is where we get to in the Old Testament with this uh, last spring in Numbers. We'll talk a little bit about it this spring in Deuteronomy, but then Joshua and Judges, especially as they begin to fight against the peoples who are already there. It is part of God's judgment that those people are destroyed because he is watching their sin build up over time. But yet here in the Lord's timetable, he says it'll be about 400 years until they experience what they deserve in this life. There are going to be many Amorites who live in terrible sin and idolatry and nothing happens to them in this way in this lifetime. Yet the Lord is working out a larger plan. So when it comes to the Bible, God was already watching the terrible sins of the Amorites and the rest of these ungodly nations in Canaan. But when it comes to his justice, it's always on his timeline. And what we also know, which we'll talk about in just a moment, is that there is no part of his justice that is ever forgotten on a people, an individual or a group. Yet, what sometimes happens is that it occurs later than we would expect. Third question and final question, can I be good? Mm, this is a good question. Can I be good? Karma says yes. The definition of good is a little hazy what it means to be good. It's kind of up to debate. But nevertheless, you can be good. You can do enough good things. And in fact, that is how we explain all the success of this world. It's everybody who was good in the past life. Everything that is fantastic right now, all the blessings of this world that we would, again, say are true blessings, like you're rich and you're powerful and you've got an IQ of 180, okay? Nobody has an IQ that high. But anyhow, an IQ, you're very smart, right? It's because you were righteous in a past life. You can be good. You can meet the standard. You can do what you were supposed to do. And you will receive the benefits. What does the Bible say? The Bible does not say that. Psalm 14. There's no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there's one who is wise, one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. It is perhaps one of the hardest truths of the entire world, the Bible, Christianity, to accept that we have fallen short of God's standards, that we are sinners in need of a Savior, that 
no matter how hard we try, nobody except for Jesus Christ has ever lived a good life. Not any of us. Yes, some people live a life further away from God than others, but everybody has fallen short of his standards. And so when it comes to God's justice, there absolutely is an aspect to it that you reap what you sow and you get what you deserve. The part we don't like to acknowledge is that as we are all going to get what we deserve, none of us deserve anything good. This is the hard part. This is where karma really diverges from what the Bible clearly teaches about the way that God, really his mercy and his grace are visited upon the world, which is that if there is anything good, it is a gift from him, undeserved, that very, very rarely in the Bible do you ever see an example where somebody is specifically sort of granted this amazing blessing just because God was happy with them. To clarify what I mean by that, we can look at a, a clear example. You can think of Solomon as the king, right? Where he prays this, the Lord says, hey Solomon, um, listen, ask me for anything and I will give it to you. And Solomon says, really what I want is wisdom to lead your kingdom. This is before Solomon fell off the deep end. He's doing great things at this point. And Solomon says, I want wisdom to lead your kingdom. And God says, I am so pleased with that request that I will give you the other things you could have asked for. But my friends, I have to tell you that by and large, God does not work with every single person like they are the king of Israel. That this world has hardships and troubles in it, and if we really got what was coming to us, if we really got what was coming to us, we would all be going to hell. So, When we talk about our sin nature, this thing within us that leads us to rebel, the thing within us that pushes us against God, you have to also notice this is part of the process. This is why we are sometimes enchanted, because part of that sin nature occasionally draws us towards things that sound good but are really destructive. So we, even if we say, oh, I know I need Jesus, we take these little bits and baubles from karma and we attach them to our lives. We say, well, I like being in control. I like the idea that things work on my timeline. I like the idea that some of my success in this life has to do with because I'm a pretty good person. We create this narrative in our heads. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Further, and it cuts both ways. One, if we're doing very well, the God must be very, very pleased. But on the other hand, and what can be very destructive is that if we are struggling, if we have cancer, if a loved one passes away, if our business has failed, whatever, if our tire goes flat, we can draw ourselves into these also false thinkings that say, well, God must be punishing me for something that's going on right now. And those things are not true either. So, some of us need to be humbled that the success that we have experienced in this life, we need to remind ourselves that it isn't a direct measure of God's satisfaction with us. Perhaps you're wise, perhaps God wanted to give you a good gift, but many successful people in the Bible needed to be humbled. Many successful people in the Bible, uh, according to the world's standards, and what we might say would be somebody who had received all the blessings of God, we find out many times that God is unsatisfied with the way that they are living. These things don't equal each other. They're not on either side of an equation. We cannot judge somebody's relationship with God, nor can we even judge God's satisfaction with us based upon our fortunes or our failures. Good output does not always mean that there is a good input. There are plenty of people living in mansions with low blood pressure who need Jesus Christ as their Savior and don't trust in Him. Right? Not that those things are bad, but just that they do not mean that God is satisfied. Okay, cut to the other side. Some of us need to be uplifted. Some of us who have bought into the narrative, this is part of the prosperity gospel, uh, have bought into the narrative that health and wealth 
And all these things can be achieved if we are just more righteous, if we just pray harder. This was Eliphaz speaking to Job, and it is a lie. All right? Later on, Eliphaz is shown by God himself to be an absolute fool for thinking these things. And so some of us need to be uplifted because we have bought into some false narratives about why it is that we are struggling physically or mentally or emotionally and that it's because God is mad at us. All right? That is not a direct measure of God's dissatisfaction of your life. Perhaps you were unwise in certain things, or perhaps you were experiencing an effect of living in a cursed world where sin and death reign. But it's not evidence of God's dissatisfaction. There are many afflicted people who needed to be lifted up in the Bible, and there are many people without a 401k or who are struggling with cancer who are immeasurably rich in the kingdom of God. Bad output doesn't always mean bad input. Okay, so these are the differences. Where do they come together? Well, one thing that karma clearly teaches is that you just get to keep going. That you just, if it's not this one, it's the next one. And if it's not that one, it's the one after that. And you can keep going and you can keep moving forward. And every single time you have the opportunity to make it better. What God's justice teaches us is that you get one shot. That this is it. The one that you and I are experiencing right now. That there is no second go around after this one. And whenever it is that the Lord decides to call you home, because he is in control... Whenever it is that you go before him, you have a really big question that you're going to need to answer, which is, why should I let you into my kingdom? Now, I want to share with you one final passage about reaping and sowing. This is the last one for this morning. And I want you to see how God really feels about good input and good output. Galatians 6, 7 through 9. Don't be deceived God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. So after all, reaping and sowing is absolutely a kingdom principle of the Lord. But at the same time, what God is most concerned about is your reaping and your sowing and where you're putting your priority in terms of your faith. There's not going to be a single person who gets to the gates of heaven and is able to go to God and say, I've been a pretty great person, Lord. I know you've been watching me. In fact, I know you've been pretty impressed. <laughs> I, uh, you allowed me to get that car that I had been wanting and that was a sure sign that you really loved what I had done. Lord, I lived a healthy life, lived a good life. It was nice. And I'm thankful, God, that you and I, we were on the same terms. That you were paying me back for that which I had given to you. You scoff, but this is the way some of us act. It's the way that some of us think. Maybe you're not that bold, but there might still be a narrative in our hearts that says the reason that my life right now is good is simply because I have been obedient to God. There might be many reasons right now where your life is good, but you cannot claim that that is the only one. So everyone needs to understand that they will go before God. The question you have to ask yourself is what will you say? What are you going to say to him when he asks you that question? Let's say it was today. Right? Not 20 years from now, not when you're ready for it, not when you had time to prepare, but like today. You go before God, he says, why should I let you into my kingdom? You can't say it's because you're a good person, because you weren't, because I'm not, because none of us are. We've all fallen short of God's standards. The only one who didn't is Jesus Christ. And so the only one who didn't deserve death was Jesus Christ. And yet, Jesus Christ experienced death on our behalf. He took the punishment that we deserve so that by trusting in him and as our Savior, we would receive the righteousness that was due to him, that is due to him, that he currently lives with in God's kingdom. 
we would receive forgiveness for our sins because the penalty had been paid. And so there are going to be the worst of the worst people who get to God at the end of their lifetime. But maybe like the thief on the cross, they say, but Lord, I, genu- I trust in you as my savior. I repent of my sin. I know that I'm not a good person. And God says, come on in. That's why we did the whole thing. It's to save a broken creation where nobody deserves to come on in. And it's the most broken people who are best able to understand the gift of God's salvation. But then the other person comes in. We've already talked about them. And they say, Lord, I've done pretty good. I don't think I needed Jesus that much. And he goes, oof, boy, I feel like you missed something. Because the point is that you needed him. You needed him the entire way. You didn't need 40% of Jesus because 60% of you had it covered. You needed him all of the way. You needed to be covered in the blood of Christ because karma is not real. God's justice is real. And God's justice says that we have all fallen short. So, in sum, right, it is good for us, right, to recognize this internal sense of justice that we have. I think the reason, part of the reason why we are pulled into things like karma is because we are made in God's image. And so there's this aspect of sort of a return of justice that we love to see. But the part where we don't go far enough is that we don't always apply true justice to our own lives according to God's standard, which is the only one that matters. And when it comes to that, we have fallen short, and the only thing that carries us through is the blood of Christ. So when you go to God, whenever that is, 50 years from now, will you be able to say, I trusted in Christ as my Savior. I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb. I know I'm not a good person, but Lord, you made me righteous because of your good gift. What will you say? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. God, we think about that future meeting with you. Every single one of us will experience it. And that thought might make some of us uncomfortable, Lord, because we don't know what exactly we might say. God, we know that our good deeds, as your prophet Isaiah says, are even the best of them are like dirty rags. Because God, we, <laughs> we so often, we rebel against you. And Lord, even our best deeds are so often done for selfish motivation and selfish gain. Sometimes, because God, we just want better things in the future. God, we buy into this idea. And Lord, it is wrong. God, I pray that your spirit would convict us, would help us to see the truth of your word. Lord, what it means to know you as our Savior, to believe that your blood has covered our sins, and God, to trust in that, not ourselves, as the thing that will carry us through into the gates of heaven. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the gift of Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Welcome back. And Connor is here with us now. Hey, Hey, and you know, as... We were kind of planning through this Enchanted series. Yeah. You know, karma, I didn't really, in my mind, when we were talking through a few of the topics, I didn't know if karma would be its own sermon. Yeah. You right. know, but man, it really did bring out to me uh, a couple, like some tendencies that maybe I had in my own mind or just like I see all over the place yeah. in our society. Yeah. And Jeremiah, you had an observation or you were talking about, yeah. Yeah, well, I just I appreciate the series Enchanted, and I thought you brought a lot of great clarity to what karma is. Thanks. And, you know, sort of illustrating this concept of, you call it an internal sense of justice. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, and I loved how you, in your, in your sermon, talking about the input and the output mm-hmm. and, and people's expectations and, and trying to help us manage yeah. that a little bit. Um, but I guess maybe could you elaborate just a little bit on this idea that uh, I think maybe I've thought this before and some others might might think the same thing, that we sort of have this account with God, yeah, right, that we're, that we're doing things to build credit and it's being deposited. Like in a that, bank account yeah, or a savings yeah. account, it's yeah. It's being deposited in this account and then at, at, at some point, uh, whether intentionally or not, we have a withdrawal opportunity. Yeah, yeah. yeah I... Uh, it's um that so going back to that internal sense yeah uh, internal sense of justice 
whether it's karma or just the way that we think about our lives um, and the choices that we make, a, a problem that we all face at various times is we want to make ourselves God. And we don't mm-hmm. always may, uh, use that language, but that's the way that we act and behave and, right. and the way that we think. And so one of the ways that that comes about is we begin to sort of grade ourselves. Um, it's kind of like back in school, you know, when uh, the teacher would say, okay, everybody, you can grade your own papers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love and, that. And that was a little bit different than exchange with somebody else. Right. And, you know, oh, for sure. Yeah. Hopefully. You have the control. Yeah. yeah. But if you can exchange with your buddy, though, it's almost That's the same. True. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> but, you know, it's when we grade ourselves, we're never as harsh on ourselves um, mm-hmm. as we, we should be. And sometimes we uh, walk through that valley of um, shame and guilt, and, and some of those things can be need to be wrestled with and dealt with appropriately, but there, there really should be a true sense of, um, of guilt, uh, that we have when we consider our life and the fact, and what I mean by that is the sense that we know that we are wrong. Right. Um, mm-hmm. so I bring that up because I think one of the reasons why we develop this like bank account is because we feel like we are doing good things that the Lord would say is, um, You can go to Isaiah and that even the best of our works are dirty rags, or at the very least that they are things that he has empowered us to do. You know, when, when we are carrying out God's will, it is something that he has empowered us to Mm -hmm. do by his spirit. And so we can't take credit for those things yet. We often do. And so because we take credit for them and we don't give God the attention and the glory that he deserves, then we feel like we're banking up. Yeah. These, these credits, these Mm -hmm. things. And we're like, well, God, again, maybe this isn't the exact language, but it's, well, God, I've done some pretty good things for you. And so I'm waiting. I have this expectation that maybe you're going to do some good things for me. Mm -hmm. But if we had a correct Mm -hmm. view of those things, our bank account, we would always be, you know, (laughs) going into default. Like we would always be (laughs) trying to draw out more than, and God would be giving us more than we ever deserved. So yeah, I, I think it comes down to how are we judging ourselves? Are we judging ourselves by God's word and what he says is right and wrong? And even a, a healthy understanding of, are good works being things that um, right. are even tainted with selfishness? Right. <laughs> or are we actually saying, and really that's moving toward the person who walks up to God at the end and says, I've been pretty great, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's all to yeah. a degree. But it, it feels good to do good. And I think yeah. so the feeling if you if you apply that feeling base to the other side, like when you're experiencing, you know, trauma or experiencing a downfall or something, we're looking for an answer. We're looking for yeah. a reason. Yeah. Well, and yeah, it, it does make us feel good to do good because that is what God made us to do, mm-hmm. right? That's Ephesians, that he w- has saved us by grace so that and prepared in advance good works for us to do. So we're carrying out God's will, and that is a really satisfying feeling. Um, but yeah, when, when things do go wrong, we want answers, right? Mm-hmm. We want to try and... Thing, it often feels like things would be so much better if we at least knew why yeah. something was yeah, happening. Exactly. You know? Yeah, after the after the sermon, Angie and I were talking, and we came up with some things like we feel like, oh, if we're nice to people, people will be nice to us. We kind of started going through things that have kind of like maybe faulty thinking on our part that we yeah. kind of have but fallen, in, get that out. fallen into, yeah. Yeah. kind yeah. of you know, without really realizing it. Yeah, but it it can be kind of nuanced too. Yeah, because there are you know blessings from God. <laughs> yes, and everything yeah. should be a blessing from God that's good in our life, right? I mean, yeah. So how do you kind of weigh that out? Boy, yeah, I. So I, I, what am I trying to say? Sunday's message, I think it's. I mean, hopefully, is in so far as I know, it's true. But it was pretty <laughs> generic, and I think the hard thing about this topic is that there actually are a number of places in the Bible, even in the New Testament, where sin results in. Uh, punishment mm-hmm. in, in, in this life, and sometimes even death, and um, uh, obedience to God uh, results in blessings. Yeah. And so the obviously the big question becomes, okay, well, where are those blessings and where are those curses? Because in the Old Testament, that language is really, really specific. You have the nation of Israel, and specifically with the Mosaic Law, but 
it's you know you you're obedient to the Lord, you worship Him, and and your crops grow better. You know, mm-hmm. it's these very tangible things. Yeah. That you're, right. You have more children, like these things that can be clearly seen and observed. And then there was the the opposite side. It was if you rebel against me, then right. all this other Blessings stuff happens. And curses, yeah. So the hard thing is that as we move into the New Testament, those blessings and curses are not as uh, clearly defined, yeah. Um, because they're often more, or maybe what I should say is they're more specific, yeah. Uh, than just being a. Ob- so, for instance, like we just talked about in Second Corinthians, uh, back in chapters eight and nine about giving, right, yeah. and about being generous. Okay, well, there are clear sort of blessings that Paul talks about there, where those who are generous mm-hmm. um, will yeah. grow. And there, it, it seems to say that the Bible says that they will grow in their income or their capacity to give mm-hmm. so that, and there's a very specific, so that they will have the ability to give more in the future. Right. And so, or you could say like, um, look at James, uh, James 5, where the, the prayers of a righteous person mm-hmm. are powerful and effective. And you're like, okay, well, that seems to attach here some kind of blessing or right. honor or uh, you know gift from God to those who are righteous. But the problem is that I think it's pretty rare that you can look at the outcome mm-hmm. and judge the exact reason why that happened. Mm-hmm. And that is normally where we get into problems. We right. say, well, you know, this this good thing happened or this bad thing happened to me. And so I'm going to try and go back to the beginning and try and figure out why mm-hmm. exactly that was. Yeah. And I think this is especially troublesome when bad things happen because, yeah. and this is a whole nother podcast, but there are a lot of reasons that bad things happen in this world. You know, it could be that um, the somebody was unwise, right? Yeah, right? Like they brought it upon themselves. Somebody else sinned against them. It could be a natural effect of the fall. It could be uh, like with Job that God had some greater plan in mind by allowing these things. Like there are a number of reasons why just trying to give a concrete answer for painful Ryan. things in this life can't always happen. So a passage that, yeah, adds nuance. Right, right? yeah. Uh, that I, I cut out just because it would have required more time, but it's in Luke chapter 13, and it's verses 1 through, I think it's 7 or something like that, but it's a passage that um, that seems to speak into this topic. It's kind of used as a proof text for not... Um, for pushing back against retribution theology. Yeah. So here's what... Uh, what is happening is there's a crowd that comes to Jesus, and what has apparently happened is, um, uh, I believe it's Herod, it's Herod or Pilate, I can't remember, but um, they have killed uh, some people, some Jews, mm-hmm. and have mixed their blood with the blood of the sacrifices in the temple, which is, I mean, just an abomination, it's, yeah. a de- it's terrible, and... So the crowd comes hmm. and asks Jesus up about you know about them and their lives, and the implicit question that they're asking, apparently by the way he responds, is were they more sinful than the other people who were not killed in this mm, brutal way? Gotcha. And then Jesus brings in actually another example, and he says, okay, well, the Tower of Siloam, and there was apparently this large tower mm-hmm. um, that fell over and killed 18 people. And he says, were they more sinful than the rest? Right. Like, were the most sinful people crushed by the tower? Right. And the sort of rhetorical answer there is no, they weren't. They were not more sinful than the other people. And so people lift that up and they're like, see, there's no, we can't make heads or tails right. of, in this case, death and somebody's sinfulness. But then what is normally left off is this little thing at the very end where Jesus says, but unless you repent, you will perish as well. Yeah. And that is not, in the context, <laughs> it's not an eternal kind of perishing. It's, it seems like to physical be... physical death it seems right to be, now, yeah, kind of like right. power will fall on you, maybe. Like, yeah. Something like that, yeah. And so, anyhow, it really what I think comes out is that we can never fully know mm-hmm. why some good or bad things happen to people. Yeah. It cuts on both sides. Throughout the Bible, people have been upset that good things have happened to bad people, mm-hmm. and bad things have happened to, you know, quote-unquote, good people. 
right? We've already talked about why that's not the best definition, but still, the righteous sometimes, those who follow the Lord, terrible things happen to them. And so there are psalms about that. Psalm 94 is a good example of one who is just crying out to the Lord because these things don't make sense, and it doesn't seem like God's justice is working the way that it should in our world. But I think what happens is if we... um, if we look only in this life, there are going to be elements where God's justice, we feel like he's missed something. Right. And this has been the cry. This has been the lament. Like, God, why have you not? Why do the wicked prosper? Mm. Uh, but what we know is that if we go into God's scale, you know, his mm-hmm. sort of view, which is that nobody, nobody escapes his judgment. Nobody right. escapes his his wrath. Um, that everybody is going to get what they deserve eventually. Uh, really what he calls us to is patience in a lot of these right. moments. Yeah. Well, and there are some principles in Proverbs that, yeah. that yeah. you know, kind of indicate in Proverbs. I mean, I, I've learned, and I don't know if you would, uh, you know, like this definition or appreciate this definition, but a proverb is something that it will most likely come true. It's yeah. not a pro- It's not a book of promises, yeah. but it's a book of Proverbs, you know? Yeah. And it does seem that if wise living does seem to bring wise results, I yeah. guess is that, like that. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a really good reminder that people that are crushed by a tower, people that are <laughs> victims of crime or victims of horrible things, yeah. you know, uh, still personally are are judged as well and have eternity one way or the other that they can look forward to. Sure. And uh, that's a good reminder for that part too. Yeah, I this was probably the biggest section that I cut out of the message um, because I, in an v- earlier draft, it was basically we were going to ask the question, okay, so then if karma isn't real, Mm-hmm. Um, and if we can't be entirely sure of God's retribution in this life, then what is the point of doing good works in this life, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And um, and and I think you know there are many answers to that, but one of the answers was because Proverbs says that those who are generally speaking. Yeah, because uh, right, Proverbs is written from a father to a son, right? And it's wise instructions for his life, and that generally speaking, when you follow these principles, your life will go according to um, you know the way that it says. And so, like Proverbs thirteen twenty five, for instance, says, "A righteous person eats until he is satisfied, but the stomach of the wicked is empty." <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we know that there are wicked people who don't struggle with hunger and there are righteous people who do. Mm -hmm. But the broader point that he's making is, yes, generally speaking, those who are wise and just and live an upright life and have integrity and work hard, all of these different things, that they will be people who can provide for their family. Um, And so when we look at Proverbs, we see that far, you know, even a... um, we should always consider what God has called us to do first yeah. and what it means to be obedient to him. But if we are looking for other motivation, if you will, uh, there are certainly ways in which we can typically find blessings in this life by, I mean, doing kind of the quintessential, like, input good works. The only uh, kind of the caveat, though, that I make, the, the splitting of the hair, is that the blessings that we receive all good things in our life, first of all, are blessings from the Lord, right? That's mm-hmm. kind of foundational thing. But as we live the proverbially correct life, mm-hmm. I don't. Th- we still can't fall into that trap of thinking that God is so, you know, satisfied with my right. life. God is so pl- kind of going back to the bank account thing yeah. that I I am now, you know, this perfect example of what it means to live wisely. And so God is just showering me with these things because he's so, God gives us good gifts, even though we don't deserve them. If we live wisely, it is because, um, or if we, you know, get these blessings, it is often because God has told us this is how Mm -hmm. things may happen. But we also have to understand, right, that a lot of the things that we want in life that we consider to be good are not necessarily God's top priorities. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. I mean, kind of have that God perspective yeah. in life. And in, and also keeping in mind with that, if you're going to go with that bank account 
uh, how much he's forgiven us and how negative we are in that account and we'll never catch up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, like, I just, this is out of left field, but just this couple of days ago, I saw that, um, was it Lakewood Church, whatever Joel Osteen's church yeah. is, mm-hmm. they just paid off their $100 million loan that, yeah. uh, that they had taken out 20 years ago. And, you know, they got 45,000 people in attendance on an average Sunday. And his statement from the pulpit as they paid off their loan was that the Lord was going to set people free this year, that 2024 was going to be a year of blessing, that Mm -hmm. it was going to be a time where he was going to, you know, set them from addictions, from struggles, from the pain in their life. And that is the quintessential example (laughs) of what not to do and how not to speak about the blessings of the Lord. Right. And so in kind of conclusion right there, it, that goes back to somebody says, okay, well, didn't you just talk about Second Corinthians and giving and blessing? It's like, yes, right. I did. But the way that he's speaking about it is not the way that the Lord works. And how can you define the two? Because one of them makes God look like a vending machine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of them has the equals sign next to it. Input always equals output. output. Yeah. And the way that the Lord works is, in reality, is um, unknown to us in many ways. His ways are above ours. Right. We cannot have, we cannot guarantee anything in our life. Um, there might be times, Tower of Siloam, mm-hmm. where, you know, the uh, uh, hardship does come upon people because they were doing foolish things or because they were sinning and they needed judgment. Sometimes it might happen that God does want to give us good gifts, even though we don't deserve them. Sometimes he rewards uh, wise living. But to try and live our lives based upon the idea that we can work our way into blessing or we can sort of shame our way into suffering, uh, that's not how God has... So just curious, what yeah. would you say as an encouragement to someone who really feels like, man, I'm serving, I'm loving God, I'm putting God at the top of the ladder, yeah. um, and yet they're still experiencing hardship? Yeah, that's a great question. So at the very end of the message, uh, I, I believe it was Galatians 6, verses like 7 through 9 or something like that. It's around that area. And this is where... Uh, Paul is saying that we reap what we sow, mm-hmm. uh, but he he says that you are really what you need to be sowing is into the spirit mm-hmm. and that, that you will reap eternal life, right? But then he says, and I didn't really talk about this in the message, but he says, but don't, you know, r- don't stop, don't quit doing good works mm-hmm. because you are building up for yourselves rewards, treasures in heaven, basically, mm-hmm. is what he's saying. Mm-hmm. And so there is certainly in God's kingdom a reaping and sowing mechanic. It is just that we go back to that viewpoint. It might not happen in this life. Yeah. So the person who is doing the righteous things that God has called them to, mm-hmm. and they are you know, just obedient to the Lord, they're going to hear that well done, good and faithful servant kind of stuff. But yeah, maybe, maybe they have loved ones who are struggling or they have health problems or whatever it is, they lost their job. Mm -hmm. What we can always rely upon is the fact that God is going to settle all accounts at the end and that there are multiple times in scripture where the meek and the suffering of the world who are righteous as well, Mm -hmm. um, who are faithful to God, who are honoring to him, that they receive sort of the prime position when he settles all things in the new heavens and the new earth. Right. Mm. Um, those who have the, in like we just know in the book of Revelation, for instance, those who have the highest position that we can see um, are the martyrs who are sort of lifted up and clothed in this, you know, these white robes, and yet they were the ones who were killed in this life for their faith. Yeah. And you say, is I don't know if there's a better example of we will, our greatest rewards will come at the end of all things, not right. in this life. Yeah. yeah. So it can be yeah. difficult to keep that perspective though. Yeah. Well, and you know, when you <laughs> when you lose your job, yeah. I mean it's kind of hard yeah. to be like, well, whenever the Lord calls me home, then, you know This will all be settled. This will all be settled. Like that doesn't <laughs> that doesn't pay the electric bill this yeah. month. Right. And yeah. so I'm not saying it's easy. Yeah. You know, it's no. but I think that it 
it can be one of the many ways that we can comfort ourselves in hard times is the truth of scripture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, well, well, I think once again, great message. I, a lot to think about. Yeah. Uh, we've got another enchanted message. Yeah, coming one up last one. And uh, so we'll hopefully see you guys all later. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> if tower doesn't fall on us. <laughs> see ya. See ya. Thank you for listening to the TBC Extra Podcast. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. We drop an episode every Wednesday, and on the first Friday of each month, we have an extra episode. Extra! Extra! With stories, pastoral teaching, interviews, and more. See you next time, and have a great rest of your week.